in the Atlanta music scene at the time, kind of the 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 clubhouse for that to whatever degree in the acoustic world was Trackside Tavern. And Trackside, when you would go there, was a like a local bar that you could get in for free. You didn't pay a cover charge. And along the uh, above where the the liquor was, there were shelves, and on the shelves were cardboard boxes. <laughs> And the boxes had the names of bands on them. And you could buy the band's music of whatever band played there out of these cardboard boxes. So it was pretty traditional uh, at that time to have album releases. Like you would celebrate the release of an album by playing at Trackside. People would come to the show. A lot of your friends would come and play your album release show. And it became like a, a way that people could become fans. And even if you were a fan of... You know, somebody whose box was on the left, you might also read all the other boxes. Yeah. You know and, what I mean? And this was run by a guy named Eddie Owen who started Eddie's Attic. And But right. this was his original breeding ground. He didn't own the bar, but he ran the bar being a bartender for, for years. And a guy named Dave, what was Dave's last name? Uh, I want to say Ramey or, I don't know. I don't remember Dave. Yeah, right. Dave. So Dave owned the bar he he let eddie trusted eddie to do the music thing and eddie had a real vision about it and he created that community that you're talking about where you he put the artist merch up in back of the bar so you could go up and when people went to trackside they understood this now he would take a, just a regular drinking bar and on the floor without even having a stage put up a couple speakers and just set the band in the corner and he started filling it out with local music three to four days a week and packing the place and teaching the audience as much as he could in that space because it was much harder than Eddie's how to respect and listen because there are really great songwriters who were who were happening right there that he was helping so he also organized this thing called heart songs once a year and that was another way that he would say he would get you to buy just somebody an audience person coming to tracks out for the first time buy into the scene as much as a band mm -hmm. so this was the way to do it and so, which was a really strange and really wonderful thing that this, this music lover who Eddie is brought to the world. It was such a, he had such passion about how to get, he just respected songwriters and how they got the stuff. And he was a fan of all of it. He yeah. sang originally, he was a fan of it. And he showcased them. And this allowed a really fertile scene to happen in the acoustic scene in Atlanta. That's what built that scene up is trackside and Eddie's kind of his, what's the word for it? His, his way of, of his maestro hand on how to develop the scene. Yeah. And it, you know, that, and then that's basically moved into a space about a mile away uh, up in the attic down in, uh, in downtown Decatur that became Eddie's attic. Yeah. <laughs> Be 
can turn the radio on Well, if you got a secret I'm your man If you out of lies I got a plan And it doesn't matter Whatever you say I won't ever run away, baby to St. Christopher's Crossing was a, hey, we want one to, we want to put one of our things up there. <laughs> exactly. And, and then I was like, ooh, I know how to record. You know, like, <laughs> I, I got people back in, Not but we have to go to Knoxville to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and even though we'd been there once and, and had a taste of it, uh, as, as a Hira's uh, recording and then as my own personal, like I was making a solo record. And essentially what I we ended up doing was making St. Christopher's Crossing over the maybe two sessions is what we decided. That's right. And um and as we made it, you know, to whatever degree, there were other people making independent records at the time. And there was a long history of independent records uh succeeding in mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta. 
and in Athens, just nearby. And then there were songwriters coming through from North Carolina or even as far as away as Boston. Like I remember David Wilcox would come through trackside. That's right. Like, on a Friday. And this was like, David Wilcox was like really a big deal then. And no artist, yeah. And, and he, would, he would play and people would be like, wow, like no one would speak. And, uh, you know, it was at the point where um, Amy and Emily, who had been playing there for a while, had just gotten signed to Epic Records. And they had made a gold record and they had it pinned to the wall. So you walked by it at Trackside, you know, like when you went around the corner. It was just bolted to the wall. And you were like, huh, okay. It's a bar that has really mediocre sandwiches and incredible <laughs> freaking... Right. You know, and cool. and pool tables, and it was just a regular everyday bar, and it was not set up for music. No, no it was no. just like a couple speakers glommed in the corner, and then Eddie had a little eight channel mixer in back of the bar, and he'd go occasionally. And, and that was, I mean, it was such, and I think that was the beauty of it, too, though. Yeah, it I mean, it's full of itself. It's, it, was, it, it, it was, it wasn't even any bigger than the Bluebird, you know, yeah. but it was the same yeah. game, you know, and, and, so St. Christopher's Crossing was kind of born out of, hey, we're playing here now, occasionally, and we and people are starting to like it. We really need to give them something they can buy and take home and listen to so that they'll know the rest of our songs. Because mm -hmm. right at the time, we weren't, we could only sneak in one or two songs that had subtlety to them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, we were, we had first walked into the scene as three of us, mm -hmm. you know, as, 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 Annie and Andrew and Christian there. Right. And that it was a incredibly powerful, the three of us getting up there was wild. You know, it was like somebody going, what is that? That's been developed outside of our environment. <laughs> For sure. I like, you know? that was the other thing, right? Stylistically, I didn't really ever play in G, C, and D. And that was the Atlantic courting, basically. <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, a lot of the, I mean, get me out of here is a D, but a lot of the songs that I was, I was watching punk bands at that. So a lot of those early songs were like, <laughs> that's what the planet earth inspired kind of, you know? Yeah. And I was just learning that there anyway. But you're, but melodically all the songs are fully formed. Yeah. You know, like, and, and, and so we were a little bit of an outsider in mm -hmm. that community because it, it, it has different um, origination points, you know? And, uh, but it came in like our, it wasn't already, rolling it came in already on tracks like a, with a locomotive on it and so as as it started to move um i think it was annie you guys had moved to atlanta we had moved to atlanta and, then, and then annie got a job at the annie got a job in miami Florida. herald in miami as a, she was a journalist she's in knoxville she worked for whittle communications but she got a job down there and so she went and lived in Miami. And now Christian and I probably had two or three Hira's shows on the books around Atlanta and we had to cover them. Yeah. So <laughs> we just by default naturally kind of had to be like, okay, sink or swim. What's this going to be? And kind of, you know, immediately it was apparent that it was, it, we were going to be able to swim for sure. And I, I think it's the wagon wheels part of the story is another six months down the line. Yeah. That's two duos, that were part of the tracks I team kind of got together, but that original spot with Christian and I kind of doing it, he had that experience with storyteller. So now f with St. Christopher's in the back of the trunk, we started kind of venturing out from the Atlanta scene in small ways as you do in the South. So we got a gig or two in Auburn. I remember mm -hmm. and she had a girlfriend who lived there. Right. We had, yep. we had a couple satellite things that we started to do off that. And we started kind of developing that a little too. And, my recollection is we never kind of made more money <laughs> than in the last year before we got signed to Atlanta. Like we were starting to play and make like 500 bucks a night. We were starting to play and then selling out CDs and being like, whoa, like we would, you know, we had developed that little network and it was only four towns. I think maybe we played Athens. I don't think we played Charleston yet. We maybe played Greenville. There was Knoxville, Atlanta. There was maybe yeah. five, four or five places. I found the gravel on my roof. Slow as I am to come upon the truth. What I still don't want to see. 
that it's time for you to be done with me. I don't want to say goodbye. You know it makes me crazy to see you cry. I don't want to say goodbye. So I'm going down to Eddie's, I'm not going to come by. It's cold ass freezing in my room. Heaters busted in this living tomb. And I can't even strum on my guitar. Because the neighbor's closer than I am far. Say goodbye. I need to come over. Play the hidey high. I don't wanna say goodbye when I'm broke down, lonely like I am tonight. When I'm broke down, lonely like I am tonight. been ripping up my boots sure did miss you for a while but my memory tricks me just about every time yeah my memory tricks me just about every time I don't want to say But the strong, that fertile ground of what he's, of what Chris is talking about, of, of how powerful trackside was as a focusing agent. That's the other brilliant thing, and he did. He set up kind of a a, 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 a blueprint of how to get yourself up on your feet. And yeah. he established a store in the back of his bar that you aspire to putting a book in or a CD, like aspire to putting some content in. You knew you had to go figure it out yourself. You went and made it. You went and pressed it. He helped you with a CD release. He did all. I mean, mm -hmm. I really love an amazing kind of Godfather. I've met only a couple people who are local uh, 
mentors in, in music like that. I met another guy just recently up in Illinois who's doing it through a house concert series, which is incredible. But it, there, Eddie is a completely unique figure in my life. I had never met anybody like him before. And I always, with time and distance, appreciate him in retrospect. I wonder what I, I put myself a lot of times in like, what was he thinking yeah. when, I, when I would insert the sentence here? And uh, I remember, cause I was at Emory just down the street and I would get out of my two o'clock class and I would go to trackside. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm in there with like the two people that have been drinking since it opened at one, you know, and, <laughs> And I'm not old enough to be in there and I'm asking for a ham sandwich, which is kind of like, yeah, I, I was grateful for the food mm -hmm. and I would just ask him things or I would try to um, pull out my notebook and copy across the mailing list or I would mm -hmm. whatever. Like, so Eddie, tell me about, you know, who do you got that's new or how, what other clubs do these people play? Like he was like an encyclopedia of what to do next mm -hmm. and somehow only let it out at a piece at a time. And then I, I remember continuing that mm -hmm. for a long time. Like mm -hmm. I remember getting phone numbers of Amy who ran the bluebird at the time from Eddie mm -hmm. who was, I, and I think it'd be fun to ask him if he was, routing people right you know to find yeah. out if there was a if there was another level to the game that i just wasn't aware of yeah. uh, but i imagine must have been going on because i remember he'd say all right pledge calendar and then we had these big giant black flip calendars and he would just book months ahead yeah you know yeah. and and so you knew in your mind that you had five more shows coming up and that it was likely to be the same people that were at the show that's coming up this week. Mm -hmm. And what in the world are we going to give them that's going to be different mm -hmm. to make them want to come back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, what you also have to remember about Eddie was he was a bartender. He wasn't a music booker. He wasn't a guy, like, I imagine like Amy at the Bluebird is, is not serving the drinks, but Eddie is a really good bartender too, in terms of yeah. like that part of being a bartender that's social. Oh, yeah. That's getting people to be comfortable and then tell their stories and then meet people around them. I mean, you know, a really good bartender is just as good at that as they are making drinks. So that aspect of, of his developmental, like all this other side, this other brain of, of helping develop a music scene was really strongly influenced and aided by that that helped him a lot yeah. right i mean you would you at, at eddie's attic the most interesting times that i remember were after shows with performers coming in sitting on stools in front of six people and playing their new songs yeah and yeah i've never so seen fun. that anywhere else right but that's Eddie, who's at, like he put a, a glass in front of you, put a little maker's mark in front, you know, in it, and then you'd sit and you'd talk and meet these people. So it was a confluence of through one person, like uh, it's just particular, right? I mean, it's the, the blueprint is particular. It's a, we had a whole other conversation about Eddie's attic and its ownership and its the legacy about it of Eddie to me is a story that is so rich because so much has come to the culture without even understanding the ghost prints of how, what it stepped through to get there. And he yeah. is a big giant ghost print that's everybody doesn't know about. I think people right. in Atlanta do, but like culturally in, in America, there's this music scene that he kind of single-handedly helped. Right.
nothing has changed as far as you can tell you're still the same as you were before you fell couple more inches and you wouldn't be standing here that car was twisted turned up on its ear nothing has changed as far as you can tell must have brushed the The most interesting times that I remember were after shows with performers coming in, sitting on stools in front of six people and playing their new songs. Yeah. And yeah. I've never so seen fun. that anywhere else, right? But 
that's Eddie, who's at, like he put a, mar a, a glass in front of you, put a little maker's mark in, front, you know, in it, and then you'd sit and you'd talk and meet these people. So it was a confluence of through one person, like uh, it's just particular, right? I mean, it's the, the blueprint is particular. It's a, we had a whole other conversation about Eddie's attic and its ownership and its the legacy about it of Eddie to me is a story that is so rich because so much has come to the culture without even understanding the ghost prints of how, what it stepped through to get there. And he yeah. is a big giant ghost print that's everybody doesn't know about. I think people right. in Atlanta do, but like culturally in, in America, there's this music scene that he kind of single-handedly helped. Right. Yeah, it, 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 and, and when we, I mean, the original, I'm, the question was, tell us about St. Christopher's Crossing, and you can't <laughs> talk about, well, you can't talk about that album until you talk about this, because this is, I had put out albums with my brother, and they, we had figured out how to do it, we'd manufactured things, we'd recorded things, we'd mixed things, we'd figured out how to, what the mechanics of it were, but the idea of doing it so that people would hear it <laughs> was a whole thing. And Eddie was like, look, now you see what a product, that's what he was teaching me. This is why a product exists. It's so that when somebody hears you right there and they're like, man, I love that. He's like, I have that song if you want it. Right. And then he would hand it to them. Right. And then they would buy it. And then they would go home and they would listen to it. And then he, it was like, he knew how to, to create a, an environment to be a fan in. That's, that's, that's really true. And also, as it, as it kind of add to that, he also knew how to inspire the performers and that content that you're putting onto that to, to, to light people up, to mentor people who are writing and trusting visions to come to them to marry them and to learn how to inspire them by showing them new stuff and turning them on to things and being you know i mean eddie also was kind of a a and r person in that way or even past yeah. the AR person that's what is that somebody who's saying i see talent in that kid i'm gonna show him i'm gonna start playing him some music i'm gonna sit him in front a late night at that bar of this songwriter and have him play right. Right. His song to that person that's changing how you write songs that's yep. expanding your whole field of creativity i remember him handing me the delamitri record yeah like man you gotta listen to that and then i you know and um so this all has brought back like a memory that <laughs> That's amazing, and it's just show back. Uh, at the album release for St. Christopher's Crossing, there was a lady from MCA Records Nashville. I remember that, right. And she had, she was maybe friends with somebody down there. I think I even remember her name somewhere. Her name's around. Debbie? Was her okay. name Debbie? No, it's uh, not Schrode. The Deb Schrode is someone else. Oh. She was a fan of ours. Um, Anyway, yeah. anyway, yeah. So uh, she was in the room, mm -hmm. and uh, and we had our album release and for that record, and it was a it was a huge celebration, and uh, I remember her hand in the card, and I kept looking. I was like A and R MCA Records. I was like, this we did it, dude. We did it on the first try. And then I just I, at that moment, I now like recall now how long the road is about to be. <laughs> You know, like, but um, that's what was going on in that town and in that room. And at the time that we were making those records, it it was a real feeling that we could make something that would be celebrated and could come be plucked. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, at the time, they were not in the music business. They were not in the business of development. Mm-hmm. They were in the business of discovery, like find, find a, find a, a, a flower that's been growing on its own in the wild, go get it, bring it to the masses and manufacture the flower. No, it's kind of probably always been that way. Right. But now it's a little different because of it's a lot different because 
yeah. it depended on the community you were playing in to develop you itself. That community, Eddie, was the development tool. Right. And all the other performers you were going through it with, you were all having that whole influence. The audience who's showing up for you shows all that. Now it's what? How many YouTube or, you know. I don't know. <laughs> right. What's your social media presence? And then what's that game? That's all. I mean, can you imagine? It's, it's a, that's a sea change of a difference in terms of how talent is developed. It was, it seemed to be a little more soulful when it was part of the community, when the brick and mortar places were, were in your music. You know, I love that, just picking it up recently, I love the art on St. Christopher's of you and I, it's a picture of you and I at Trackside with the bricks in back of us. Right. And it's just a candid shot. We're just on stage. You're, you know, we're, we both have our guitars. We're singing. It's like, that's where we came from. And we wanted it to say Trackside Tavern behind it. It did. We, we, yeah. picked, we picked that on purpose because in the off chance that this became really big, I wanted yeah. some person somewhere else to be like, what's that? Yeah. You know, and uh, because we were proud of it and uh, we felt connected to it. And um, at the time, there was a little bit of like, you know, MTV had had started a thing at night called 120 Minutes and bands that were on 120 Minutes, say five years before, were now like mm -hmm. selling five, 6,000 tickets a night. Mm -hmm. Like it was really, it wasn't, you know, when the, the odds of pulling something like this off as a real life were just way not in your favor. But the more you hung out in that club, the more it seemed slightly more possible.
graduating from college, which was amazingly strange to now think about in retrospect, because in the week that I graduated, we played the opening of Eddie's on that Wednesday. Right. That's crazy. And I graduated on that Friday or that Saturday. And it was like Mikhail Gorbachev was the speaker and it was translated through the Russian translator over the loudspeakers and I was hung over. It was really odd. And, <laughs> and we had gotten the phone call in March of that year. Cause we were up with Ellis in Boston playing an in-store at HMV. <laughs> and I had and called my head to pull it off. Cause it was that hum humongous blizzard. We didn't even play. Right. Yeah. right? And I, I called my answering machine while we were eating soup or something. And I came back from the, the payphone and said, guys, uh, I, there's a message on the machine from Jennifer. It looks like they're going to offer us a record deal. Wow. And it didn't close by the time I graduated college, but mm. it was there in front of us Yeah. in that year. So that was 1992. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it probably didn't close until October of that year. And we probably made words like numbers during that time. Yeah, that's right. And then the record didn't even come out until 94 because they bumped it a year. Yeah. Although, and that was not from any scheduling stuff, but that was from our management. Once we yeah. got management, Leopold, they had, they had said, let's take this original recording and take it over to Hugh Padgham and sweeten it up and kind of right. re, re, re gloss it. So, yeah. So there was, you're right, a period of a good, year and a half in between getting signed originally and us finally seeing that light of day the wheels stop playing and you and i are like now we're on a different track now we're producing right thinking about how, what are we going to do for atlantic we, we got management i guess that's the next part of the story really but how, yeah how but it's just a really interesting um launch because and now that i hear us talking about it, it was very community 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 and then our community just kept getting smaller yeah. Because our experience became more and more unique. Like we, we were not in a, there weren't other people that were also signed to Atlantic in our backyard. Yeah, that's true. Even though uh, awkwardly they were all over the Southeast. Yeah. <laughs> when you look it's back true. at it. <laughs> right. You remember while we were there, they called us and they were like, what do you know about Hootie and the Blowfish? You I remember know? Jason Flom saying that. I recall. And that was when, after we'd made our second record there, that yeah. was released during Bloom's time. Yeah, and Collective Soul. Yeah. And all yeah. This, it was all coming from the Atlanta scene. And so, you know, the Southeast, that's this breeding ground of, like, how to develop an act or let an act self-develop, you know. Or Atlanta's a remarkable scene in, it, between hip, uh, for now 20 or 30 years, being under the radar of 
being seen as a, as a cultural scene of, of import, just like Seattle or Nashville or Austin or Atlanta's kind of like a, like a stepchild of those. And I never understood why, because so, so many different scenes between urban and hip hop and rap and, and country and folk. And I mean, wow, what town has such a rich, um, has such rich American heritage as Atlanta does. It's like, whoa. I mean, Leonard Skinner developed in a, a weird little bar downtown Atlanta in, in 1975. The Allman Brothers played Piedmont Park. That's how they, I mean, Atlanta's history is like, it's staggering without being con- considered the right. top shelf of, 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 of you know? Of music, yeah. What's your take on that? Why is well, that? Uh, well, actually, being involved now in the Grammy space, they're, uh, they're about to announce that there's a Grammy museum. Oh, that's good. Gonna, be here and it's mainly uh this the success of of hip-hop around the world as like the dominant communication of of music and fine and now there's somewhere you can go yeah you know just like when if you're if you're chasing the blues you there's somewhere you can go you know If there, there used to be, if you're chasing punk, you'd, you'd end up at CBGB's and you'd be like, wow. I mean, now it's like a t-shirt store, but, right. but still there's a place you could go. Right. And I think they're going to do that and celebrate it. It's always been interesting to me when I would hear the stats, I'd be, they like for a number of years, like seven or eight years, 80% of the Grammys won in America were from Atlanta. Isn't that incredible? That's insane. It is insane. And, and when you think about it, you're like, well, that can't really be true. And then when you start adding it up, that the, the Christian music scene here in north of the city is unbelievably thorough. And, and, and between Mac Powell and all the third day stuff, they won everything. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you got CC and BB Winans and all the gospel world. Uh, yeah. You got like all of the R&B world, which is Retha, all that stuff. And then you got, you're not even to hip hop yet. And you're not even to white people, you know, like, (laughs) like, oh my gosh, like there's so much cool here. And uh, it's, it's just a different, I I don't know why it doesn't get the conversation, but I love to bring the conversation up. Yeah. It's a worthy conversation for sure.